This is a crisis. The Senate must vote the Chancellor emergency powers. He can then approve the creation of an army. If only Senator Amidala were here. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is going to break down the planet, biology, history, and culture of the Shagrian species. A people with some of the most laid back and peaceful vibes, but also the most evil aids to powerful Sith Lords. But first, I want to thank this video's sponsor, Keeps. Guys, did you know that two thirds of men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they reach 35? I'll tell you a funny story. You see, I got the long hair going, and uh, my fiance was noticing that I'm getting a little bit thinner up here, or she suspected I fought her on it. And uh, I hadn't hung out with my dad in a while, and we finally hung out, and we're together for a couple hours, and out of nowhere, he's just like, Are you thinning up top? <laughs> it was really funny, but it was poignant that uh, maybe I need to do something about this. Keeps is the hair loss company to work with since they let you work with doctors from the comfort of your home. You'll chat with them online and they'll review your situation and make the right recommendations for you, with the product being shipped out every three months. And keep in mind that prevention is key! That all treatments like this take four to six months to take effect, so act as quickly as you can. Don't wait until it's too late. And they have generic versions of FDA-approved medications that make it a lot more affordable. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss today, go down to keeps.com slash metanerds or click on the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash metanerds. But let's get back to the Shagrians. The Shagrian story begins in the inner rim world of Shimpala, at grid coordinates L8, right next to Shili, the home of the Tagruta, and not too far from Coruscant, the capital of the galaxy. Their home world had one sun and three moons, having standard gravity and type 1 breathable atmosphere, with a 27 hour day and a 318 day year. The databases classify it as a water world, but there was a high percentage of it covered in land, though nothing that was that high above sea level. In fact, there were no mountains, and the tallest points were modest plateaus. This greenage is all dense rainforest, a planet sized tropics with endless beaches, as these were not distinct or separate continents. All the major land masses connected to each other, and there were a few small islands. As for their biology, there isn't much data on their evolutionary cousins that came up on this world, but many, if not all, species here arose from the seas. The Shagrians are amphibians, each starting life in clutches of three or more tadpoles averaging 30 centimeters or about a foot long, and they would stay completely underwater for a long development period until they grew their limbs and developed lungs. Now they could breathe air and were strong enough to climb the rainforests, craft habitations, and hunt. For the rest of their lives, they would be able to breathe perfectly both underwater and above, though there were some aspects of intermediate physiology that faded away. In the heat of these tropics, they would secrete a green sweat, and one of the stranger results of their sea dwelling was the tongue and sense of smell. They have incredibly poor taste and smell, and use their forked tongue to pick up smells like a reptile, flickering it to pull molecules into something equivalent to a vomero nasal organ, which is actually found in many different species. They possessed almost no taste buds, and their sense of taste got worse as they entered adulthood. But many Coruscanti biologists agree that this must be due to the salt composition of the oceans on Champala, as Shagrians that grew up off-world did not experience this gradual loss. As a people, they never developed cultural dishes or things like restaurants, gaining no joy from eating, and seeing it purely as a chore to stay alive. Later, they would be known to carry sensors that could quickly scan the nutritional value of the thousands of alien foods that they were exposed to, choosing what dish to eat purely on its nutritional content. And most would prefer to consume meal replacement shakes and sticks that all other species found to be gross and bland at best. Their vision was excellent in low light conditions due to eyes that developed to be able to see deep underwater, allowing them to see about twice as far as humans. But perhaps their most striking feature were these horns. The top ones are similar to the horns of other species, but these fleshy bottom ones are called lethorns. The fleshy parts are made of thick skin and fat, and would grow thicker with age, while both would reach about half their length by the time they reach puberty. Both males and females have these lethorns, but only the males had the horns, which were used for competition with other males as the males would get into these intense underwater duels which often led to death, all in order to impress the females, who even millennia after this fell out of practice were still attracted to males with longer and thicker horns, seeing it as a sign of strength and virility, often correlating heavily with confidence and thus success even in the high-tech modern world. These females also had these longer and wider posterior head plates than the males, likely also filled with fat and developed to stabilize in the ocean. One of their greatest defensive attributes was due to their blue skin. 
Early on in their evolutionary development, their sun became unstable and unleashed something like a coronal discharge or solar flare, bombarding the planet with dangerous amounts of radiation that provided single generation mutations. This created a blue skin color, having to do with blue and purple being a higher wavelength or energy. It is unclear why the Darth Warlock line had this red skin color, but as they were the only known Shagrians to not be blue, we can assume that this either was the result of being born on some world that did this to them, perhaps a genetic mutation and that's why all of his line are red, or it's just the result of Sith shenanigans. And the Shagrian average height was 1.9 meters or 6 feet 3 inches, which makes them nearly as tall as a Wookiee, and they would live to be around 76 years old, right around humans. As for their history, when these people started to grow their civilizations, primitive huts in the jungles would develop into cities, and eventually into large floating collections of structures that would fill up with water during high tide. Due to their biology, they carried on with life just as comfortably, swimming to and fro, eating, socializing, and sleeping whether in air or water, their cities being half the time like those Mon Calamari metropolises, with one quirk being that there were many buildings that did not have any staircases or any kind of elevator system. They simply waited until high tide to swim to those higher floors. Now they would care for their clutches of tadpoles and sealable tubes which circulated fresh water from the waves, while also helping to prevent them from being snagged by predators or float away. It served a dual purpose of being able to tell when the child matured, because as soon as they were able to climb out of the tub, you knew that they were strong enough to navigate the world. They never really had trouble finding food or resources on this planet-wide tropical paradise, and there were very few accounts of tribal warfare. This created a culture of peaceful and law-abiding citizens, immune to greed, and in older ages as they contemplated death and the meaning of life, they were known to grow more stoic and live ascetic lives, living in Spartan quarters with very few belongings. In a world with such abundance, they didn't take as much as they could, instead the lack of scarcity made them more comfortable giving things up. On the rare occasion that conflicts rose to the level of bloodshed, their strict respect for order led to the tradition of combatants wearing a deep burgundy red, called the Color of War, in order to set themselves apart from the community. And being located on one of the most crucial and well-traveled hyperspace lanes in the galaxy, the Hydean Way, and only being a grid coordinate away from Coruscant, it wasn't long before they were contacted by the spacefaring races. While other people were known to fight the alien invaders off, or sell out their own people, the Shagrians saw a peaceful integration into the galactic community. That cultural lack of greed and violence meant no opportunistic warlords or slavers that popped up. Instead, even these alien visitors saw Shampala as a planet-sized resort. Even the Shagri language was noted as having a pleasant sound to it, nothing like that of the Huts or Geonosians. And with the help of translator droids and Republic educational specialists, they were able to establish schools all across this world. And before long, many Shagrians were proficient in Galactic Basic. Though most would not learn to read or write in it, unless they pursued some career off-world. And schools weren't the only thing built here. Spaceports and massive resort buildings were going up on the major plateau areas, and a lot of the natives actually preferred to live in these new urban areas, eager to get a glimpse of the fantastic variety of alien species, and talk with them about their homeworlds and galactic events. These are one of the few people in the galaxy whose world and people exude such positivity. They quickly learned to expand into restorative spas and all sorts of sports on the waves of their oceans, and excursions to see the beautiful wildlife of both their jungles and seas. By this time, the practice of jousting with their horns to attract a mate was banned, and was mostly replaced with arranged marriages. Many that lived in the tourist areas or off-world found the horns to be an encumbrance in the halls and doorways of these metallic cities, and their daily grooming rituals involved filing them down. The global population would reach 3.5 billion, being 99% Shagrian and 1% other, or about a constant rate of 35 million vacationers on Shimpala at any given time. Their main industry was tourism, but they also produced a lot of luxury goods. Like we saw with the Rodians, this was typical of planets that had a lot of labor, but not a lot of high-tech manufacturing capabilities. All their major import were the brilliant technological marvels of their advanced alien friends. The only occupation Shagrians never tried a hand at was being a chef. That lack of taste meant that all chefs in these Taurus cities were of some other alien species. When the Shagrians wanted a vacation, their favorites were the water worlds like Liansom and Moncala, as they would be able to adapt in most oceans as many had similar chemical composition. And there were some colonies established, but as Rusk explains, pacifism is a luxury reserved for the core worlds, especially when you're a neighbor of Coruscant. But in the Outer Rim, these ideals were often deadly. I came from a pacifist colony, Master Jedi. We were bullied remorselessly by pirates, corporations, huts, even governments. I joined the military as soon as I could. Peace only comes to those willing to fight for it. 
and those Chagrins that joined the military service of the Republic or other factions were all universally loved by their subordinates. Chagrins were known to make great commanders due to their calm and rule-abiding nature. Even if they did force their men to fight to the death, their lack of greed meant that there was no fear of them becoming bribed or traitorous. And it was a common belief among soldiers that if your commander was a Chagrian, you could count on being well-fed and never short on supplies or equipment. All of these positive stereotypes help with the public image of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. When someone saw the human next to the Chagrian, in the minds of many, this blue being would have conjured up the images of a carefree, optimistic goodwill, or stoic, heroic, and charitable generals, all completely untouched by vices and immune to greed. A great and rare thing for a politician, and implicit feelings that Palpatine definitely wanted to be connected with. Ironically, Massa Media was one of the few beings in the galaxy that knew Palpatine was a Sith Lord, and he was believed to be on the Trade Federation payroll, and actively schemed with Palpatine to get Finis Valorum removed. When the Empire came to power, having a vacation world was not as important as gathering resources for their war machine. Many areas of Shampala were torn up and bays poisoned by Imperial mining accidents, after highly refined scanners did find some materials that could make excavation profitable. But the Galactic Alliance was able to employ technologies to clean up these areas, and return them to be as healthy as ever. During the Civil War, many Chagrians joined the Rebel Alliance, wearing the traditional Color of War, which wasn't too off from the Phoenix symbol and the Rebel colors, working the red into many locations on the uniform. Later, they would be a major politically active member of the New Republic, though Darth Warlock and Krait's empire would spread so much terror that this red-skinned antithesis of all things Chagrian did hurt the image of these people in the eyes of so many species. So that's it for the breakdown, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind-the-scenes stuff. Besides Masamita and Warlock, there were several famous and infamous Chagrians throughout the millennia, including Orso Mita, a prominent slaver, the liberator of slaves and founder of the Sailor's Union, Sirik Oleg, Sol Dekon, the prominent lawyer who prosecuted ex-Jedi Terry Vila, as well as an unnamed Jedi from the Old Republic era. And also in that era, there was another red-skinned Chagrian. This may be evidence that this was just a rare mutation, or that this one was also dabbling in the dark arts. And although there isn't much on it, there was a brief mention of a religious figure revered on Shampala, named Aram Arkaron. It seemed to be a type of spirit or war god, as it was prophesized to emerge from a holy site called Logrok, where it would one day burst forth from the rock and deliver them victory over their enemies. This species was introduced with the Phantom Menace in 1999, also seen in the Old Republic video game, and expanded upon in the Essential Guide to Species, the Atlas, and Complete Locations. So that's it for the Chagrian species. If you made it this far, please hit that like button, leave a comment, and share it with someone who will like it. Those really are the best ways to help a video grow on YouTube. Subscribe if you want to see more, and check out the description for discounts on amazing metal print art from Display and free audiobooks from Audible. You can also see our Patreon and PayPal. And special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier, Matthew Beltrami, Bill Payne, Brandon Robinson, and Jace Peck. But most important of all, remember, even positive speciesism may inadvertently help a darkness-worshipping psychopath politician. And the Force will be with you. Always.